Hello, Paul. Uh, good morning from this side of the Atlantic. Um, we are going to ask you questions about your talk. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions in the comments, but I'm going to ask you that in your when I visited you in Sheffield in 2016, and when I was walking with you, you told him that you had a plan to write a new edition of your fantastic book of Sisters of mm -hmm. the Oral Odontogenic Sisters or Sisters of Oral yes. and Maculofacial Regions. Yes. And you, you told him that you, you are planning to, to uh, reduce the text of the book and put some whole slides image or something like that and uh could you let us know uh, if, it, if we will have a new edition of your book soon okay so here it is <laughs> all the notes i'm sitting here in my study at home behind me you can see papers and books. yeah so the new edition is about 16 chapters and 10 of them are finished. Um, mm. I'm writing Necratus's chapter now, today. I've been working on it this morning. That's the most difficult chapter of all because um, it's so complicated. I see Ricardo's there in the, in the background. He'll know how complicated it is. I've used reference a lot of his papers and uh, Carolina's papers in referencing it. So it should be finished by early next year. <clears throat> and I hope it will be published by April or May next year. It's going to be quite different to the old edition in that it will have a more standard layout. Uh, the text is reduced a little bit, but there is more uh, pathology in it more diagnostic pathology, more differential diagnosis, and it's aimed at, um, it's more accessible. So people should be able to read it at all levels. So students should be able to read, read it as well as consultant pathologists who want a pathological guide, as well as overviews of pathogenesis as well. So um, it won't, um, be such a detailed review of the literature as previous editions because the literature is now moving so quickly. There are more than 750 publications on the Kratosist wow. since um, the last edition. And the things like um, biomarkers and molecular pathology is moving so fast that it's very difficult to attempt to keep up to date on that literature. So rather than try to be comprehensive in the literature review, I'm putting in overviews and pointing people where to get information from. So it's on its way. Great information. Uh, I always recommend it for my students, not because you uh, are my supervisor in my, in my postdoc, because the book is fantastic. Yeah. And well, yeah. The there is on your, your shelf. No, there, is yeah. a, there is a Portuguese edition of it, of course. Um, yeah. But I have to be honest that the old edition is quite difficult to read for, for trainees and students. It's quite complex in its analysis of the literature. So the new edition will be much, much easier to read and to access. Yeah, because if not wrong, your the chapter of odontogenic erotocysts have 30 pages or something like that in your in the fourth edition uh maybe even more than that more than that yeah um, it, it will still be a long chapter right but i think it will be um easier to read i mean it's a big topic the dontogenic crisis is very big yes so, um if you yeah, you're right conversation going on Odontogenic keratosis. I would like to ask you, in your talk, you clearly show it that there are two subtypes of odontogenic keratocysts. One that 
don't have two hints of genetic alterations and yeah. the other that have two hints okay yeah so yeah. would you call it the the odontogenic keratosis in the next uh who classification mm -hmm. as odontogenic keratosis and odontogenic uh, keratosis tumor based on this difference right yeah. you could do that but as you said in, in in at the beginning of your talk right you said that who intends to make the classification easier lighter okay and if you have to check these hints two hints this might be expensive for some countries in the future yes. yeah yeah i think yeah. this so, is the point and if you uh and you made clear that odontogenic keratocysts doesn't behave like a tumor if he, when you do marsupialization in these cysts, right? So is the clinical behavior more relevant than the genetic alterations, uh, in, in your opinion, to say this is a cyst or this is a, a, a tumor? I, I, I made this question because if you deal with odont uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, uh, the, the follicular aspect, you can find cystic errors as well. And the clinical behavior is very good as well. So yes. I, I yeah. know it's quite debatable, the, the terminology, if it's a tumor, if it's a cyst. But I'd like to hear you once again about this issue. Okay. So I think this is actually quite an important issue. I don't know what the next WHO classification will do. Apparently, they've already started thinking about the next one. Um, right. My feeling is, so first of all, I think there may be even three different types of odontogenic crisis cyst. Um, you've obviously got your syndromic cysts, which may have just one germline mutation. Some of them may have a second loss of heterozygosity, so it's got two hits. Then you've got your sporadic odontogenic keratocysts, some of which show mutations, just one mutation, and some of which show just loss of heterozygosity in one allele, and some of which show a mutation and loss of heterozygosity, and some no show no change at all. <clears throat> So from the genetic or molecular perspective, you've got multiple different types of, of genotype or, or molecular change. There's very, there's only a few papers now just emerging to show that the histology may correlate to the genotype. So we know, for example, that syndromic cysts more often show micro uh, satellite cysts, more often show they actually do more often show budding. They more often have solid areas and they have a higher mitotic rate. So that's one area where there is some evidence for genotype phenotype correlation. Uh, there's also some evidence now that sporadic cysts with um, patch mutations have a different phenotype to sporadic cysts without patch mutations. So Shimada in Japan has published quite recently showing, for example, that cysts with um, patch mutations and evidence of hedgehog signaling show epithelial budding and are more likely to recur. So there is some evidence for a genotype phenotype correlation. And then you've got what you mentioned, the fact that a good proportion of cysts do actually show two hits which is suggestive of neoplasia, but not an absolute definition of neoplasia. But it does suggest that a good, it does suggest that virtually all kratocysts are associated with an alteration in the hedgehog signaling pathway. And some of those, a good proportion of those are due to mutation events. And some of them have two hits consistent with neoplasia. But others, a good number, have simple alteration of the hedgehog signaling pathway 
possibly due to loss of heterozygosity or DNA methylation. And the signaling pathway switched on. And the evidence for that is by seeing uh, immunocytochemical expression of hedgehog proteins. But those changes are also seen in dentigerous cysts, some radicular cysts, and a whole range of other benign lesions, not just odontogenic, but others as well. So there is some evidence that there are there's a key molecular event to drive the pathogenesis of Kratocyst, and that some, if not all, may be neoplasms. At the moment, I think the evidence suggests there may be a subset which are of neoplastic origin, or could be classified as neoplasms, but a lot more work is needed, I think. I mean, a lot of these cysts show loss of heterozygosity of multiple genes, including P53, FHIT, and others as well. Um, as to a whole range of other benign lesions or other non-neoplastic lesions. So the answer isn't easy, but I think there's evidence that a subset of kratocysts probably are neoplastic, but more work is needed to determine that. But what you're saying is absolutely right, that the overall behaviour of the lesion and the principles of management, I don't think will change whether we call it a developmental cyst or a neoplasm. So from the point of view of management, it really makes no difference. I mean, the management of the odontogenic kratosis is now uh, very well established, I think. I know there are a number of ongoing studies at the moment on marsupialization versus, with, versus enucleation with carnoids versus removing the overlying mucosa. But most of those studies are showing that if you enucleate very carefully and if you do use carnoids, the recurrence rate is very low. The analysis of the hedgehog pathway, though, has also uh, raised possibility of some um, drug treatments. So there are some hedgehog signaling pathway blockers, which are used for, say, basal cell carcinoma, which also cause reduction or um, uh, disappearance of kratocysts, but I'm not sure we're at a point where we could recommend signaling blockade just to treat solitary kratocysts, for example. So I think your answer, the answer to your question in a nutshell is that <clears throat> even if it's a neoplasm, it shouldn't make any difference to the way we manage them. But it might make a difference to the way that people claim on their insurance policies. <laughs> for sure, yeah. For sure, and it has sure. changed. Sure. Yeah, and it has changed some of the attitudes towards insurance, especially where insurance companies are paying for treatment. Yeah. So, um, I think there's more work needs to be done, because in my lecture I also showed about the beta catenin gene uh, mutations in um, calcified endogenic cysts. So, does that mean they're neoplastic? No, I don't, no, not necessarily. You've got a single mutation or a single loss of heterozygosity with activation of the wind signaling pathway. And that causes the aberration. It's a developmental defect or it's an aberration of a developmental pathway, which, which may be involved in the pathogenesis of the lesion, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a neoplasm. I haven't seen any evidence for two hits in... COCs yet, but even if there are two hits, does that necessarily mean it's neoplastic? So, and the other thing that I'm struggling with is what is a neoplasm? You know, the definition of a neoplasm now is becoming increasingly complex. Is it purely genetic or can we define based on clinical behavior and management? Now, I think, I think at the moment, because we understand behavior and management very well, we're still using behavioural aspects of the lesions to define whether we manage it as a neoplasm or not. But for the academics and the uh, research purposes, we have to think about neoplasia in a different way. Yeah. So, it's a very complicated discussion. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic, odontogenic yeah. keratocyst. It's a fascinating topic. And we, have, just... yeah, we have a big audience in our uh, live now. And I'm sure we can pass this challenge 
for this audience as well that you have to study more and you have to do a lot of research on odontogenic keratocysts than we yeah. have been doing before. So yes, I think this is the the main message. And maybe we are going to have this subclassification in the future. But yeah, I think the, the clinical management is well established for odontogenic keratocysts. Okay. So let's uh, read the questions. From well, the I'm looking at Ricardo yeah. has um, put a question up. Yeah, so we, um, uh, let me say that we receive a lot of congratulations from our audience. Gleison Amaral, Willy, Prof. Willy Van Hirden, Manuela, uh, and Ricardo Gomes. Uh, make us uh, questions. Dr. Lelia Souza, Leon Robson, Elaine, Vivian Wagner, Eliette, so Felipe Martins, Silveira. We've got a few questions for you. I think we can start with Ricardo Gomez. You can read it, Paul. And yeah, okay. So I guess Ricardo is listening. So, Ricardo and Carolina, we're, we're looking to you to sort out the um, molecular pathology of these lesions. I've been following their work very closely over the last few uh, couple of years. There's some amazing work coming out of that group. But his question here is about the basic pathology and essentially about the role of the pathologist in diagnosing these cysts and that particular problem of um, a false negative result from an incisional biopsy. And this is a perennial problem, isn't it? That yeah, a large yeah. cystic lesion, um, almost always the surgeon will take an incisional biopsy from, you know, the gingival region, often retromolar region or round about the third molar region, because it's easy to do. And then you get a small um, biopsy comprising the cyst wall. And Ricardo asks how we can get around that problem of misdiagnosis based on small biopsies. And the answer is, I really don't know what we can do. Um, the only advice I always give is never make a diagnosis on a very small biopsy unless you're absolutely 100% sure. So some lesions have uh, pathognomonic features. You know, the, the typical odontogenic keratosis shows I showed you in the lecture, you can make a very confident diagnosis. But other things, such as an incisional biopsy from a cystic amyloblastoma, you can't make a diagnosis because on, although it may look like amyloblastoma to epithelium, it could be a fragment of a unicystic amyloblastoma, it could be a fragment of a cystic portion of a solid amyloblastoma, or it could be a fragment of an amyloblastomatous area in another cyst type, such as a calcified endogenic cyst. So a diagnosis there would be impossible to make. Um, so I would never, for example, make a diagnosis on a small portion of an amyloblastoma to cyst lining. I would always be very cautious and I'd wait to see the nucleation specimen. Um, sometimes molecular pathology can help. So in the particular problem that Ricardo mentions is um, a recurrent glandular odontogenic cyst, but uncertain about the diagnosis. And I guess the main differential there is the possibility of a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So a MAML2 translocation might help. If that's positive, you can say it is a, a mucoepidermoid. But if it's negative, you can't because 50% are negative anyway. Um, if, you, if you're not sure, you have to alert the surgeon to do a conservative enucleation, make a definitive diagnosis, and if necessary, they have to do more surgery. And that's all we can say, really. Yeah. Okay, next question, Vivian Wagner. Where's Vivian? Yes. Hello, Vivian. What's she asking? I'm, yes, it's 
Oh, gaps in knowledge. Well, one we've just mentioned, I think there'd be I think there'd be some very worthwhile work to do on the genotype, phenotype of the odontogenic cratocysts. Um, and I alluded to that work from Brazil of 2,500. Now, that was only a short case report, a short report, a short communication. So there's an awful lot more information that could be gained from that large series of 2,500 cases. And it would be possible using a series of that size to do some genotype phenotype correlations. I think that might be quite helpful because uh, it's possible in the future that we may move towards a, a genotype classification. Um, we're not there yet, but I think genetics is becoming increasingly important and it might be possible. And of course, where you have a genotype, you often have a biomarker as well. So in the future, we may see genotypic type classification, but a genotypic classification is only worthwhile if it changes phenotype and management, as you mentioned earlier, Pablo. It yeah. doesn't alter management. It doesn't really matter what the genotype yeah. is. Yeah, the subclassification by genotype becomes an academic exercise, and surgeons actually get quite... Um, understandably get quite irritated if pathologists keep subclassifying things when it doesn't affect their treatment or their management because it confuses the issue for patients. Um, so other areas, I think we need more work on calcifying the odontogenic cyst and the, the uh, beta-catenin gene mutation. We need to understand what that means. Um, I think we need to understand more about the pathogenesis of cysts generally, the developmental cysts. So although we know that inflammatory cysts are driven by inflammation, and it's intuitive that you can talk about cytokines and growth factors being switched on which drive cell proliferation, that's not as easy um, in the developmental cysts where we don't have a clear understanding of what drives the initiation of the actual cyst itself. And I'm sure a lot of them are driven by, if you like, epigenetic, epigenetic alterations in um, signaling pathways that are involved in development. And in fact, um, Carolina and Ricardo and um, Diniz did publish a nice paper looking at molecular pathogenesis, showing how the the signaling pathway aberrations arise, may arise at different levels in the developmental pathway of odontogenesis. And where the alteration takes place may affect what lesion develops. And I say alteration rather than mutation, because although it could be a mutation, for example, very early in the dental lamina, a mutation might drive the formation of a cratosis. You know, through the hedgehog pathway, but later on, a mutation might drive the development of a calcifying odontogenic cyst by the wind pathway and beta catenin mutations, because in the wind pathway, which is, is arises later in development, that tends to be involved in hard tissue development at later stages of odontogenesis. But as well as mutations, you may get epigenetic changes that alter the signaling pathway, and that might determine the development of some of these lesions, particularly when you see them in younger lesion, in younger people. So I think more work on um, the correlation of the pathogenesis of the cysts um, using developmental pathways as an analogy. I mean, I think a lot's understood about that, actually, but some of the work hasn't yet been applied. Okay. So there's plenty of work for Vivian in the future. Right. Um, Any more questions? Next question is Felipe Martins Silveira regarding odontogenic keratocysts. Uh, yeah. If you listen, man. Ah, right. Um, there are quite a few papers now that correlate histological characteristics to recurrence. And the, 
the main two in terms of histological characteristics are budding of the epithelial basal there and um, the number of satellite cysts. So you're more likely to have a recurrence if the basal layer is budding and there are satellite cysts and or solid islands of uh, epithelial rests in the cyst wall. So cysts that show those changes are more likely to recur. Um, but probably the single most issue, as I mentioned, about recurrence is the way it's treated. So lesions that are enucleated alone um, are much less likely to recur than a lesion which is enucleated with followed by carnoid solution. And lesions that are enucleated removed of the overlying epithelium are less likely to recur for, for complicated reasons. Um, and lesions that are resected, if you actually do a resection, which people very rarely do, I mean, I don't think, I wouldn't suggest it, but where there have been series where lesions have been resected, they hardly ever recur. Um, but the recurrences are very, very closely affiliated or aligned to the type of treatment, not only to whether it's enucleated or not, but also to how much time and care is taken over the nucleation. How carefully is the cavity examined? How carefully is it curetted? Is there been attention to detail? Because you know when you get the multilocular cyst, you get bony septic. Well, you need to be, <clears throat> you often need to rupture or remove those bony septic. <coughs> Excuse me, to make sure that you remove the little multilocular areas. So the amount of care and attention also matters. Um, so the more care is taken over the removal to make sure it's completely removed, the less likely it is to recur. And that also, of course, involves careful review of the imaging before you start your surgery. But the ones that have evidence of microcysts, budding, and uh, islands in the wall are more likely to recur. Um. We have congratulations from your talk, uh, for your talk, Dr. Professor Adalberto Mosqueda Taylor. Thank you for a great lecture. Yamele Ruiz, in Mexico. Maria, thank you, Adalberto. Mariana Villarreal do Rego, great. Oh, hello. Besos from Venezuela. Hello, Mariana, thank you. Janete Diaz Almeida from São José dos Campos, Brazil. Professor thank Spade, you. thank you for the excellent lecture. And Yameli, Leon Robson, I think the next questions, the next question was made by Leon Robson. Thank you, Liam. Well, I know that Liam is correct, collecting cratomedalbastomas at the moment, so my answer to Liam is, we're waiting for you to answer that question, Liam. So um, we're looking forward to it. <clears throat> um, I think the answer to your second question, are they misdiagnosed? Yes, I think they are. Um, I think some cratoamidobastomas are solid oncogenic cratocysts, but you know that the literature is debating. There is a a debate in the literature. So both these lesions are quite rare. But there is a debate in the literature that keratoamidoblastoma arises from so-called solid odontogenic keratocyst, that they're related lesions, and there is a spectrum of change. And I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure if there is anyone who's done a study specifically of solid odontogenic keratocysts to look for patch gene alterations. If there are solid odontogenic keratocysts with patch gene alterations, they are in the, the large sets that have been studied. I haven't seen any specific studies looking at that. And if anyone knows of one that I've missed, I'd be very interested to see that. So a series of solid odontogenic keratocysts with mutation analysis or patch gene analysis would be very interesting. 
Um, and a good comparative study of cratal medulloblastomas and cratosis would be quite useful as well. And we looked to Liam to do that study for us. And then the answer of solid orthogenic cratosis is an appropriate term. Um, no, because they're not solid, they're multicystic. They appear solid at surgery and they appear solid on radiology quite often, but they're actually multicystic. And in fact, morphologically, they are a, a low power morphology or architecture is indistinguishable really from a multicystic amyloblastoma or a multicystic cratoamyloblastoma. They look virtually identical at very low power. So they, so solid is a descriptive term, but they are multicystic lesion. And whether or not they're a separate entity, I don't know. Um, at the moment, we regard them as odontogenic cratocysts that have, as it were, an excess of satellite cysts to form a multicystic lesion. Uh, but there aren't enough described yet to be able to really um, give much information on their behavior. Yeah, okay. we have to, to wait for Leon's research. Yes, we do. Yeah. Thank you, Leon. We're looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, I think we have a question from Jean dos Santos. Dear Professor Paul Spate, congratulations for this brilliant presentation. A long time ago, I met Professor Peter Zayk. <coughs> He said, go to study with Professor Spate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I yeah, used to I, work with Peter Isaacs at University College. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes we deal with some cysts, radicular cysts, by the clinical, without feed and lining. The question is, do you conclude then yeah. as a cyst, if it has a cystic stru structure, and are you used to perform immunohistochemistry to distinguish cysts? Thank you. Right. Okay, so a cyst without an epithelial lining. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned radicular cyst specifically there, uh, Gene. So um, a radicular cyst often lose their epithelial lining because they're very heavily inflamed and often the lining becomes indistinguishable. So on histology, you may not see an epithelial lining because it's either been lost in the inflammation or the biopsy doesn't include the lining or it's been lost during, um, during the biopsy and processing. It's become detached and got lost somewhere in the specimen pot. So sometimes we do see a cyst without a lining, but undoubtedly, if a cyst is heavily inflamed, the lining can become ulcerated, so you don't see a lining. But I'm still very happy to call that a cyst. Everything points to it being a cyst. Um, the argument becomes more nuanced or more difficult when you look at cysts which are clinically cystic, but aren't lined by epithelium. And I think in particular of the, what we call the mucus extravasation cyst. And there is a debate in the literature about, or certainly more in the textbooks actually, that the mucus extravasation cyst isn't a cyst because it's not lined by epithelium, therefore you shouldn't call it a cyst. <clears throat> so a number of textbooks just use the word mucosal, and some textbooks use the term a mucus extravasation phenomenon but actually clinically it's cystic and it looks like a cyst so i'm fairly comfortable to call it a cyst and ironically some of the textbooks that refuse to call the mucus extravasation cyst a cyst are very happy to call solitary bone cyst a cyst you see the the irony and some of them still call aneurysmal bone cyst a cyst but they don't have epithelial linings at all. So the argument isn't, doesn't, isn't well made, but you can't call a lesion a cyst if it hasn't got an epithelial lining because clinically they are cystic and clinicians refer to them as cystic 
and radiologically they have a, a cystic architecture. So I'm debating what to say about cysts when I do this new edition of the book. But I'm going to stick to the term cyst um, to include lesions which are clinically cystic and which are commonly called cysts in, in the clinical parlance. But you might call pseudocysts technically because they haven't got an epithelial lining. And then Jean asks about um, immunocytochemistry in cysts. No, hardly ever. There's immunocytochemistry has very little role as a diagnostic aid uh, for distinguishing the different cyst types. There's some evidence that calretinin is quite useful because it may specifically stain amyloblastomas and therefore might stain, for example, unicystic amyloblastoma and differentiate it from other cystic types that might resemble it. It's not 100% specific, but calretinin is one marker that can be useful. But in general, immunocytochemistry doesn't have a role. And there are hundreds of papers still being published now that um, looking at biomarkers dis to distinguish between the different cyst types. Um, most, a lot of them look at odontogenic craft cyst, dentigerous cyst and radicular cyst and use a range of biomarkers. And they show, for example, different keratin patterns and different levels of um, proliferation in the cyst wall, different levels of BCL2 or Key67 or PCNA. And that tells you a little bit about the differences in the cyst that might help you understand their growth patterns or their pathogenesis. But when you have only one cyst to look at, it doesn't help in, in um, diagnosis. There are some papers that suggest, for example, that the keratin profile is diagnostically useful. But the papers that do that will take 10 typical cysts, 10 typical dentigerous cysts, and 10 ridiculous cysts and show that the keratin profile is different. So for Kratos cysts, for example, they express keratin 10, but they only express keratin 10 when they are keratinized. If they're inflamed and they've lost their normal or typical keratinized pattern, they don't express keratin 10 anymore. But if they are keratinized, you don't need keratin 10 to make the diagnosis because the diagnosis is evident on the hematoxylin and the eosin stain section. So there's a flaw sometimes in the argument about these keratin markers being valuable for diagnosis, because they're only, they only mark the cysts which are typical. And if they're typical, you don't need it to make the diagnosis. So I found immunocytochemistry to be not particularly helpful. A good hematoxylin and eosin stain section is the most important thing for diagnosis. Uh, I think, would you sign out uh, these cases as a radicular cyst without a feeling? I think that is the question. Will you sign out as a radicular cyst that if you don't see the feeling, are you comfortable with? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I think that is the question that Jen. Yeah. I mean, it might be a periapical granuloma, of course, with early with early degeneration. So you have to try and make that judgment. But if it's, remember, you can't diagnose ridiculous cysts without clinical information. So yeah. there's got to be a non-vital tooth. It's radiologically at the apex or close to the apex of the tooth, and it's inflamed. And the cyst, the lining may have ulcerated. But if it meets all the criteria of non-vital tooth. The clinical features, I'm happy to sign it out. The only thing to differentiate it from is um, degeneration in the center of a periapical granuloma, and that's sometimes a bit more tricky. But if it's a lining with a fibrous cyst wall with, a, with, a, with an inflamed center, but no epithelium, I'd be happy to call it a ridiculous cyst. But if it was a large granulomatous accumulation of inflamed granulation tissue with a central cavity, I might call that a periapical granuloma. Does that help? 
Yeah, I think so. I, I, I saw a case yesterday that we don't see uh, uh, epithelial lining, but we saw uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation, uh, cholesterol crystals, so and the X-ray support the diagnosis of um, yeah. radicular cysts. Maybe you can make a note that we don't see epithelial lining, that the, if you, uh, based on clinical uh, X-rays and um, uh, histological aspects, you can suggest a radicular cyst, Jan. You can do that, maybe, yeah. in my opinion. Um, okay, the, we, Eliette Guerra from Brasilia, uh, congratulated you as well. Um, we received a, quest, a question from Irene La Fuente Ibanez de Mendoza, uh, Spain. Uh, my question is about the classification. Simple with microcystic. <coughs> okay. So <laughs> this brings us to the... Do you remember when John Wright gave his talk? Uh, yeah. The SOBEP, he talked about splitters and lumpers. Yeah. And I was actually going to mention it today, but I took it out of my lecture about how we were criticized for being lumpers and not splitters. And I think Irene is right that there are different histological features within the ontogenic kratosis. So you get the very simple one, which has a very thin lining with nothing else to be seen. No, no microcyst, no satellite cysts, no... Um, islands in the wall and then you get others which have masses of satellite cysts and and are they different well at the moment we've we've, had, we've already said haven't we? we we need to find out whether they're genotypically different but at the moment i don't see any real need to um subdivide or to split the cysts into multiple different types because you could do the same with dentigerous cysts or ridiculous cysts you could say that the ones that show variable histological features should be put into a different diagnostic or classification pigeonhole. But if there's no difference in their overall behavior, then I don't see any need at the moment to do a, a subclassification. Because remember, at the moment, a cratocyst with microsatellites and a cratocyst without, you still must manage them the same. So the, the subclassification, I don't see any real um justification for that at the present time no yeah but raven the ecuador great thank you prof Gr greetings from ecuador daniel thank you daniel goldenberg um please vinicius could you put this question on, on this on the screen yep thank you Oh, sorry, Daniel. Sorry. You should have told me and I wouldn't have moved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who, well, who did Daniel do his PhD with in the end then? I wonder. Maybe he'll tell us in a minute. Um, if you'd written to me in advance, I would have stayed at UCL. <laughs> there were some people who moved to Sheffield at the time with me to do their PhD. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Irene has just made a comment. Sorry about my question. Simple with microcyst and solid multicystic. Yes. Well, I think that's a yes. I know exactly what she means there. So, the solid odontogenic kratocyst is solid multicystic. And there is this view, which someone else asked earlier, that is this a different entity? Well, I think the answer is at the moment we're not sure, but it could well evolve you know, over time with, with more research that the solid odontogenic kratosis does become a separate, um, is separated uh, by, um, is separated off as a, sub, a subtype. Yes, that might happen. So Daniel says he did it with Stephen Porter. Oh, hard luck, Daniel. 
Yeah. No, I'm sure it was fine. Actually, I do remember now seeing some of that work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't talk about uh, calcifying odontogenic cysts so far. So let me make a point. We see a lot of calcifying odontogenic cystic, the classical cystic uh, in our uh, laboratory. But the solid version of calcifying odontogenic cyst that now is named as a dentinogenic uh, ghost cell tumor. Yeah. Do, do you think we need to, to do more research about it? We need more cases about the solid counterpart of calcified odontogenic cysts. Uh, I don't know if he, because uh, in, in my opinion, it was easier to classify as a, as a solid calcified odontogenic cyst than a dentinogenic ghost cell tumor, but it's my my feeling. Uh, I don't know your, your opinion. Could you repeat your vision about calcified odontogenic cyst, please? Well, if you look at the group of the, the ghost cell lesions, the, the ghost cell odontogenic lesions as a group, 80% of them are very simple cystic lesions um, of which a proportion, about 30% of those, are associated with an odontum. Um, all the evidence suggests that they're driven by a aberration in the wind signaling pathway, as are odontomes as well, which may also contain ghost cells occasionally, and that they are a developmental anomaly. The dentinogenic ghost cell tumour um, tends to stand alone as a solid tumorous mass, which grows and is usually solid. But some of those are also cystic or multicystic. So there is undoubtedly a crossover between cystic dentinogenic ghost cell tumors and calcifying odontogenic cysts that might have proliferations in the wall or a mural proliferation. The one I showed in the lecture had the big prominent luminal proliferations, but not a mural proliferation. So I think there is a little bit of a crossover between the two lesions. Um, but if you take account of, if you say that the calcifying odontogenic cyst is simple cystic with no mural islands, if there are mural islands and or it's solid, then it's a dentinogenic ghost cell tumour. So from a histological point of view, the distinction is not too difficult. But in terms of their etiopathogenesis, I don't know what the answer is. A lot more work is needed to know whether how related they are in terms of pathogenesis. You know, and I think now we're looking at this idea, this realization that these aberrations in signaling pathways are responsible for these are uh, seen in cysts, which we know are developmental, such as dentigerous cysts, and in lesions that we know are neoplastic, such as amyloblastomas. Um, and the signaling pathway may be switched on by epigenetic events or aberrations of growth factors or by mutational events, there's clearly a spectrum of change in these lesions from developmental to neoplastic. And it may well be that the cutoff, we just don't know where that cutoff is. So using histology alone, or even behavioral characteristics alone, we can't know where the cutoff is between a developmental lesion and a neoplasm that might look like it. I think we're looking at a big spectrum. And that means we may have to think again about the way we classify our lesions. Because at the moment, we have a classification of dontogenic tumours and a classification of dontogenic cysts. So we have two pigeonholes. And we argue endlessly about whether a lesion should be in that pigeonhole or that pigeonhole. And if it's in the tumour pigeonhole, it appears in the tumour textbook. And if it's in the developmental pigeonhole, it appears in the cyst textbook. But actually, you might be looking at a similar lesion within a spectrum. 
So in the classification of cysts for the future, I think, I think it should always be in the blue book with the tumours. But we might well see now cysts of developmental origin, cysts of, develop, of inflammatory origin, and cysts of neoplastic origin, accepting that there's a spectrum of change between them. But the key thing is what, going back to what you said before, Pablo, is they've got to go into the right pigeonhole so that the surgeons know how to manage them. It's management that's important. Yeah. And I think I think the COC to then tynogenic ghost cell tumor might sit in that big spectrum of ghost cell lesions, which are all similar but different and may have a spectrum of change and pathogenic mechanisms. And, and the management uh, is different as well. Because, yeah. 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 So, so what you want to be able to do when you look at the histology of the lesion is to put it into the correct management pigeonhole. The diagnostic pathologist right. doesn't necessarily have to put it into the, the correct genotype pigeonhole. You want to put it into the right management pigeonhole. Great. Um, Irene Lafuente, Ibanez Mendonça, she asked you, my question was because could the differential diagnosis of incisional biopsy of multi-cystic odontogenic keratosis be with a schemal's odontogenic tumor? Yeah, absolutely. Although squamous odontogenic tumor, remember, looks very bland. It doesn't have peripheral palisading and it's very rarely cystic. So if you see a lesion where you can't tell the difference between the two, you'll be looking, you'll be either thinking, am I looking at solid islands of epithelium that might be associated with a kratocyst, or am I looking at solid islands which are a squamous dontogenic tumor? And if you can't tell the difference, then you have to get another biopsy, essentially. I think that's the answer. Yeah. Let's talk about um, glandular odontogenic cyst. Uh, sometimes I, I have a great difficulty to sign out this diagnosis because we don't see all the aspects of glandular odontogenic cyst, but you cannot name the cyst with a better name, so you suggest as a glandular odontogenic cyst. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, sometimes we the, a differential diagnosis can be uh, mucopidermoid carcinoma intraosseous, yeah. and you can use fish for maximum translocation to differentiate these lesions. Or do you think these molecular alterations, these genetic alterations, will be the, the answer for these challenging cases in the future, we are going to find other translocations in the cysts or in, in the tumors that we can use in our uh, histopathological service. No. No, I don't think you can. I think it's getting too complicated. So... I quoted the paper from uh, John Kutlis's group in histopathology where they showed MAMEL2 translocations in radicular cysts and dentigerous cysts that showed mucous metaplasia. Now, they felt that that was a pilot study, that it needs to be repeated. It hasn't been repeated yet. No one else has duplicated that work. But it's really interesting that a, something that's an inflammatory cyst or a developmental cyst that shows mucous metaplasia or prosoplasia, as he called it in, in his paper, has a MAMEL2 uh, translocation. And I don't really know how to interpret it. Does it mean that the MAMEL2 translocation might drive mucous metaplasia? Or that the cysts with mucous metaplasia are early uh mucopidermoid carcinomas that have not yet progressed 
So I don't know what it means from the biological point of view. I think it's really interesting, but I don't think we should interpret it in terms of trying to understand the biology of the lesions at the moment, because it's too early days and we need to see more work. But what it does mean is that when you do the mammal 2 translocation, if it's negative, it doesn't mean it's not a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, because only 50% are positive of intraosseous. And if it's positive, we now have evidence that a lesion with mucous metaplasia might show the translocation. So it really does leave us in a, in a real quandary about diagnosis. But my view would be that if it, if it looks like a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, histologically and radiologically and on its clinical behavior, and it has a mammal 2 translocation, that is really, really good evidence that it is truly a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. But if it, if it doesn't look like a mucoepidermoid carcinoma on clinical features or radiology or histology and it's positive, then I think the, it becomes very difficult to know how to diagnose it. Very difficult indeed. The issue with the glandrodontogenic cyst is that, uh, well, Craig Fowler's paper, he had the diagnostic criteria for glandrodontogenic cysts. And if you had, if you had six of uh, six features present, it was almost certainly a glandulodontogenic cyst. And if you had seven features, it was definitely glandulodontogenic cyst. But we know, as you said, Pablo, especially on small biopsies, you sometimes only see one or two features. Um, the ones that are most consistent with the diagnosis are epithelial thickenings and plaques and superficial columnar cells. And if they're present, especially if there's also mucous cells with duct-like structures, then that's not diagnostic, but it's definitely almost certainly going to be a glandrodontogenic cyst. And if the radiology matches that, then I think you can make the diagnosis. Um, but you really need the whole lesion to make an accurate diagnosis. And I think it's really difficult. I think ultimately it comes down to evidence of infiltration and invasion of surrounding bone and the radiology. If it looks infiltrative, if it's invading the bone and the radiology isn't well demarcated and benign looking, then mucoepidermoid carcinoma is definitely a serious consideration. Yeah, we, we can learn with you, Paul. It's quite clear for me and for our members that you, you, when you are signing out a cyst, you have to consider the clinic, the x-rays, the microscope findings to sign out as a cyst. We, you have to think about all these features. I think this is an important message from your talk today for our members. Okay. Well, you showed, I mean, as a learning point, you know, you showed me one the other day which neither of us is sure about. Very difficult. Yes, very difficult, yes. And uh, we're going to have that in the case seminar, are we, next week? Next week, yeah. yeah. Uh, I sent uh, a, a referral case to Paul Spade. The case was uh, sent to me from, uh, from Professor Fabio Witt from Londrina, Paraná. And it's a very interesting case, a very challenging case. And we don't know if it's a glandular odontogenic cyst or a mucoepidermoid carcinoma intraosseous. So you, you are going to discuss this case once again next week. Yes. Yeah. Am I right? It was quite heavily inflamed as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. And yeah. it was eroding the cortical bone as well. Okay. Yeah. So that's a... So that just thought me of a diagnostic point is that when these lesions become inflamed, they often lose their typical diagnostic phenotype. Yeah, for and sure. They be, and they can be very, very difficult to diagnose. Yeah. And in fact, you know, sometimes you get an infected cyst in the jaws, which um, has all the radiological features and the clinical features of a odontogenic cratocyst. But histologically, you find a cyst that is heavily inflamed with evidence of infection, often with pus, 
and there's no epithelial lining or there's fragments of non-specific lining and a diagnosis is impossible. Uh, you, all you can diagnose is, a, as an, is an inflamed cyst. So inflammation is a, a real problem in, in diagnosis. And obviously, when cysts get larger, they often become traumatized or they become continuous with the oral cavity through a, um, through a hole in the jaw or through the periodontal pocket of an adjacent tooth. So they become secondary inflamed. They may then become infected and the diagnosis sometimes is impossible. Um, no yeah. number of biomarkers will help. No. Um, I got a message from WhatsApp. Uh, Dr. Belinda Bum from South Africa. She made a question. Oh, Belinda. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a greater propensity for squamous cell carcinoma to arise with, within odontogenic keratosis compared to other odontogenic cysts? And is there a difference in risk for squamous cell carcinoma to arise within sporadic versus syndromic odontogenic keratosis? <sighs> oh, right, okay. Um... Well, the answer to that is that I've got a pile of papers here um, on, on that topic, which I haven't quite got around to reading yet. So <laughs> you might have to wait for the next edition. <clears throat> so I'm making a table of it. But I think, in essence, um, there isn't, there are a lot of case reports of carcinoma arising in odontogenic keratocyst. So if you look at, if you superficially look at the literature, the impression you get is that odontogenic keratocyst more often become malignant than other types of cysts. But I think that in case series that have looked at it, there is no difference. And in fact, there are, <clears throat> there are less in keratocysts than other cyst types or a very similar number. So I don't think that the odontogenic keratosis is more particularly prone to malignant change than other types of odontogenic cyst. And I'm not sure, I haven't seen any evidence, but there might be some among these papers here for a difference in malignant change between syndromic and sporadic. But I haven't seen any evidence for that. Yeah, I don't think so. Not yet. Thank you, Belinda. That hard question. Yes. And I think Elena Rivero, thank you, Prof. Spade, for the enlightening talk. And she thanked me as well. Uh, okay. Okay. I think we have no questions. So I think your title, the title of your talk was very clever as usual, and everyone in our audience cares about odontogenic cysts, <laughs> not only who cares. Good. Uh, yes, great, great title. Uh, and uh, we have no words to express our gratitude uh, for taking our time in, in this Saturday morning here and Saturday afternoon in UK. I'm sure everyone enjoyed a lot your talk and your uh, conversation, your explanation. Okay. You have a fantastic experience um, and we have to thank you always. Oh, you have been supporting okay. SOBAP for almost 10 years and so we cannot thank you enough. You cannot thank you enough. Okay, thank you so much, Pablo. I've really enjoyed talking to you all. Um, I've, I've always, I learn things from people's questions and get ideas as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.